Just before we get started with today's video, this one is brought to you by one of my absolute favorite sponsors, Shaker and Spoon. What do Shaker and Spoon do? Well, they are a monthly cocktail subscription box, and what that means is they send you one of these truly magical boxes, which contains all the ingredients you need to make 12 fantastic cocktails. What they do is they provide three recipe cards in here, the Sea Fog, Hemingway, and Nika, if I'm pronouncing that right. And don't tell Richard. They provide, basically the only thing they don't provide is a bottle of, I believe with this one it's aged drum. So grab your bottle of aged drum and you're good to go. There is tons of stuff in here to make these cocktails from unsweetened lemon juice, coconut water, even packets of cold brew coffee. I have no idea which one that goes through. But not just that, look at that. There's the dried orange garnishes. There's nori, which I thought was just for sushi and stuff. Even to the little details. Look, there's four little dried bananas in there. It's wild. And also, you know, uh, where you have to go out, you know, you get some fancy cocktail recipe and they're like, oh, you need like two drops of Eye of Newt. And then you have to go and buy an entire bottle of Eye of Newt that's like four liters. And then you're like, oh, what am I going to do with this? Well, good news. Shaker and Spoon provide all of these tiny little bottles with absolutely everything. This one's not so tiny, but absolutely everything you need. Through the magic of television, we're going to go home. I'm not sure if it's this box I'll be making up at home. I think I've got a whiskey one that I'll actually be making. And uh, you'll see some magical B-roll of that right now of me mixing it up at home. And while you're watching that, I will tell you that so it makes 12 cocktails, three of each recipe, one bottle of liquor makes everything. It's super convenient, obviously. I mentioned that with the eye of newt thing. Complex drinks made simple and easy to follow with easy and to follow instructions. I myself, uh, absolutely huge cocktail fan. <laughs> I'm a huge wine fan. I'm a huge beer fan. I'm a huge cocktail fan. Like anything, I love it. And uh, yeah. I mean, especially like the last few years, not going out for cocktails so much. And uh, now I've got kids, so I just don't go out as much. But what I do do is you can drink at home. And with Shaker and Spoon, it's just convenient. It's easy. It's wonderful. Um, if you're into cocktails at all, even if you're not, you should get Shaker and Spoon. It's it's fantastic. And through my link below, which is uh, shakerandspoon.com forward slash criminalist, by the way, you can get $20 off at checkout, which is... Uh, which is great. Look, I just think this is, this is, as I said, one of my favorite sponsors. I love the cocktails that I make with them, and it's all super easy. And uh, yeah, go check out Shaker and Spoon. There's a link below in now today's video. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon, and on today's episode, Ivan Millet, Australia's most notorious serial killer. What happens here? If you're new, I have a script in front of me that I've never read before. And we are taking this cold read thing into potentially... Uh, irresponsible waters today because this script is by it's not by callum don't worry callum is still around but i realize we haven't been on the most reliable publishing schedule yesterday and while i don't have a problem with that the sponsors that make the show possible they're like simon <laughs> we need you to make more episodes because you missed our spots and i'm like yeah okay okay guys i'll sort it out don't worry so uh david david baker who uh has written for me before so it's not like i'm gonna read this and i know it's it and it would be nonsense david's very talented writer he's written as i said he's written for me before so i'm sure it's going to be good <laughs> but uh yeah we i didn't want to i didn't want to read it before recording it because I, with casual criminalist especially i feel like part of the charm of this show is uh that i kind of discover what's happening with you guys all i know about this is this about australia's most notorious serial killer and that it's going to be a very long episode because this is a very thick thick pile of paper that I've got in front of me. So uh, let's just jump into it. As I said, Ivan Miller, Australia's most notorious serial killer. Thanks to David for writing it. Thank you to myself <laughs> for reading it. And Jen afterwards is gonna add in those uh, images if you're watching this show, that audio, if you're listening, and let's go. It is the Australia Day weekend. At the end of January 1990, a former sailor in the British Navy, Paul Lanyons, interestingly named, aged 24, has come from the United Kingdom to Australia to do a bit of backpacking. He spent some time in a hostel in Sydney, then he took a train to the outskirts of the city with the intent of hitchhiking all the way southwest to Mildura. And thank you, David, for putting a pronunciation guide in there, because <laughs> I would definitely mispronounce that. People had a massive go at me, like, I, I, ne I didn't live it down on Twitter forever because i pronounced melbourne melbourne how it's spelled to people were like yo fact boy it's melbourne ah, idiot melbourne he lives in melbourne it is that way around though right melbourne not relevant on the new south wales victorian border where he hoped to get a job as a fruit picker this is the most british thing i've ever heard 
like uh, when i was 18 this was a very common thing like you'd go on a gap year gap year to australia or uh yeah australia was very popular i didn't i've never been to australia and uh, you'd get it i think at least back in the day what happens is you could go there people would backpack for six months and then if you wanted to extend your visa for six months i think you had to get a job in like do some farming or something which seems really strange but then you could go work on a farm for like three months and they'd allow you to extend your visa for another six months or something like that <laughs> don't go and go to australia based on this advice definitely look up the visa policy before you go i'm not an expert and this information is probably a good 15 years out of date but uh yeah that was the thing okay we're a paragraph in maybe we should hurry up a little <laughs> thirsty from the summer heat paul onion stops off at a convenience store to get something to drink it is there that he's approached by a man in his 30s or 40s dark haired tan muscular wearing a plaid button-up over a t-shirt and sporting a bike moustache the man sees paul onions carrying a backpack and out of nowhere offers him a lift south onions cannot believe his luck and accepts i get the feeling like most of the time if this was you know not a true crime podcast we'll be like oh what a lucky guy he got a ride all the way south i mean i've hitchhiked a few times in my life oh my god one of them <laughs> as, as, a, as a racist story not not from me but from the people i was hitchhiking with and uh, i was just like hitchhiking and then they were saying all this like racist stuff and i'm like oh who have i got in the car with and they're like this was in america and they're like do y'all want to come to like a, a barbecue we're having tonight and i'm like no thanks <laughs> i just dropped drop me in the town i'm really tired just gonna go to the motel and hang out alone <laughs> it was very weird um so yeah half the time i've been hitchhiking was uh was with racists great down the road the driver begins to behave strangely on edge jumpy paul and the man make conversation and the man starts ranting about immigrants coming into the country from asia what <laughs> is everyone who just offers people hitchhiking rides a racist this was not about people from asia it was uh i was in georgia uh and they were just uh they just didn't like uh african americans very much which was uh definitely a bit of a weird experience for me it's like oh <laughs> we already covered this <laughs> but it was really uncomfortable at this point because i'm not a racist at this point paul feels his friendly warmth towards the man drain away but there is something else paul can't quite put his finger on for some reason alarm bells start ringing in his head and he starts observing the man closely about 90 minutes down the road the driver takes an abrupt turn towards balang oh there's a pronunciation guide thank you again david Bellanglo state forest a sprawling thick mass of pine and eucalyptus trees stretching for 40 square kilometers or 15 square miles onions doesn't know the roads and is none the wiser as to why the man would take this route i don't know dude i'm sitting in the passenger seat of that car and he manages to drive it deeper and deeper into the forest which is off the highway like not the direction i'm going i'll be like oh god okay i guess i'm getting murdered today i mean i just assume at that point that it's murder although this guy probably survived i guess to tell this story or maybe the less nice way to think about it would maybe be the serial killer or i'm assuming serial killer because of the title of today's episode that he's telling the story later about how he murders this onions guy but i'm hoping for now that paul onions escapes and gets to tell this story which is great but I'm, it sounds a bit hopeful doesn't it onions doesn't know the roads and is none the wiser as to why the man would take this route the reason is simple in the forest no one will find the body oh brilliant the oot slows down the driver is constantly looking in the rear view mirror for other cars paul onions finds this odd and asks if there's a problem the man replies that they're losing the radio signal from sydney and that he's going to pull over to get some cassette tapes out from under the driver's seat paul finds this strange because there are cassette tapes sitting right in front of them within the man's reach the driver pulls over gets out and starts rummaging under his seat paul decides to test his reaction by getting out of the passenger seat and standing by the side of the road the driver immediately asks paul why he's gotten out paul explains that he was just getting out to stretch his legs after an awkward pause paul decides that he's being paranoid and gets back in the car and puts on his seatbelt, and they take off again a minute later the driver pulls over again and he says he'll look under the seat one last time for the tapes in a swift fluid movement the man pulls out a revolver and aims it at paul this is a robbery the man snarls uh-oh it's not a robbery it's definitely not a robbery you'd have robbed him already why are you driving into the woods and robbing him now he's also a backpacker what the you're getting murdered paul mate he reaches under the seat again and pulls out a length of rope when paul sees it he with a sinking feeling he realizes that whatever the driver intends he was going to take his time in a split second decision paul leaps out of the vehicle leaving all of his stuff behind and just legs it he runs down the highway the man shouts after him or stop or i'll shoot but paul keeps going 
The man starts firing the revolver and pursuing him on foot. Paul begins frantically waving down passing cars. Oh my, I, I have to say, like in my mind, Australia is just empty. <laughs> Which I mean, I know it's a huge country. Not that many people live there, relatively. So most of it's empty. I'm assuming just, you know, in those, you know, there's quite a few Australian horror movies and there's never anyone there. It's always just like, yeah, yeah, of course there's no cars coming by. This is Australia, but I'm really glad that there are. They slow down to see what's happening, and then they speed right off again in fright. Paul notices the man getting closer. Paul resolves to jump right in front of the next car that comes over the crest of a nearby hill. He'd rather be hit by a car than submit to whatever fate the man has in store for him. Yeah, pretty smart, dude. You can't just be like waving down cars because he'd be like, oh. If I was driving, I'd be like, let's not pick up the crazy guy. But if he's jumping in front of my car and waving me down, obviously there's some emergency, and I would stop. Probably to my regret, because the other dude's got a gun. It's like, I don't carry a gun in my car. Maybe if I was Australian, I would. Are guns allowed in Australia? Paul Onions leaps in front of a family caravan driven by Joanne Barry, who is heading out to Canberra with her sister and five children. Joanne stops. She sees that Paul is panicked and shaken. He shouts, he has a gun and he's going to shoot me. Paul dives into the sliding door and hides behind the driver's seat. With the roar of the engine, Joanne swiftly pulls away. As Paul looks over his shoulder for one last look at the man standing in the road, he sees something strange. The man is smirking. Oh my god. This is like some terrifying horror movie sh right here. Just, this is one of those episodes where I'm just recording this alone in my dark office and end up looking around for like the smiling man in the corner with the gun. I hope you're not alone right now. I, it's like, I hope you're surrounded by people in public transport or like somewhere, you know, where you're not alone because that would be, I'm, I'm scared. And I'm reading this. Joanne Barry drives to a nearby police station in Borel. She heads inside with Paul Onions. Together they report what has happened. Neither of them had clocked the number on the man's license plate. The stretch of road had no significance to the police. The report gets buried in the local police files and is quietly forgotten. Paul spent, wait, the dude was like discharging a gun at another dude. The police aren't going to go out there and like, I guess he's long gone though, right? So yeah, the police are like, what's the point? We'll just be wasting our time. And in this case, I, I know normally we rag on the police for not doing their job, but in this case, ah, they, they kind of did, and you're not going to find him. Paul spends some time back in Sydney. He tells his parents he was robbed. His girlfriend arrives, and they tour Australia together, this time on a bus. Smart move. Although if it's a greyhound, I don't know if Australia has greyhounds, but as I mentioned in previous episodes, I did the greyhounds around America. I'd almost rather risk hitchhiking. <laughs> like when I hitchhiked in the States, it was actually on that same trip. But after my Greyhound passes expired and I just needed to ride into town because I was hiking in the forest. God, I'm surprised I didn't get murdered. And that might have been the end of Paul's story, if not for some gruesome discoveries made along the same stretch of road. The bodies of Belanglo. Oh no, I know there was a pronunciation guy before, but I've already forgotten how to say Belango. I'm not going to look it up. I'm sorry, Australians. <laughs> I'm sorry, David. He's probably watching this. You don't have to include them all the way through. We'll just accept that I'm a bit did it. Uh, it's the 17th of, December, of September, 1992. In a small clearing in the middle of Belanglo State Forest, far off the bushwalking paths where people seldom tread, two people are practicing their orientationing, ori orienteering, and they discover a corpse. Orienteering's got to be one of those things that kind of just... When was this? 1992? Yeah, like post because i remember having to do orienteering at school i was in the navy cadets and we'd have to go out into i don't know into the forest or into some random fields and it'd be like okay you've got to orientate yourself using like three points of reference on the map and there'd be a weird compass with all sorts of lines on it and i was like yeah but we got gps don't we <laughs> why would we do that i remember i think i've maybe even told this story before like when we i did the duke of edinburgh gold um, which is like a st it's not stupid it's really nice i was gonna it, like as a kid it seemed very important you do that you get into university it's like one of those things you put on your cv as a 16 year old and i never finished it actually i did all the requirements i just never filled in the bloody book <laughs> um and what was i talking about yeah yeah we'd go hiking and they'd be like well you've got to orientate yourself and a friend of mine had an early gps system from a boat like his uh his parents had a boat so he took this like gps um, radio device thing and it told you your coordinates so we just used that so essentially we cheated on our duke of edinburgh gold which feels a bit it was great it was I, i'm gonna say it feels bad but i never really went to, i never got the gold thing so i'm like whatever <laughs> great story fact boy why don't you carry on with the episode okay where were we they alert the police oh they found that the orienteering people god that was a long diversion for a pointless story 
The orienteering people, they alert the police. The following morning, a second corpse is discovered 100 meters away from the first one. They're later identified as British backpackers Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters, both in their early 20s, who were last seen on the 18th of April 1992. Police find the remains of gags and ligatures at the site. The women must have been bound and gagged as they were transported from a nearby vehicle to the killing grounds where they now lay. Both women had been raped. Walters had stab wounds to her upper spine, inflicted by a bowie knife just below the neck, which would have paralyzed her and rendered her helpless during the killer's assault. Oh my god. This, I don't know why, but I find this one of the darkest things. I have no idea what TV show it was, but it stuck with me for years as being just the most terrifying way to die. There was, I think it was like, I don't know, it was one of these drug cartel ones. And as soon as you mention cartels, you you know it's going to get scary. They would paralyze people by cutting their spine and then torturing them and then putting them in a box. Like, he'd pack the body into a box while they were still alive. They just couldn't move because they'd been paralyzed. And I'm like, you know, at that point, it's like, you're not ever going to walk again or like move again. And then you're being like raped and tortured. And I'm like, that is just, I can't. I just want to immediately move on because this is just so unpleasant to think about, which, uh, I mean, I probably should have thought about before starting a true crime podcast, I guess, but here we are. Um, The killer evidently tried the same maneuver with Clark, stabbing her once below the neck but not severing the spine. Caroline Clark was blindfolded with red cloth and her head was used as target practice, being shot ten times from three different angles. Oh my god. I'm already like, let's get this mofo and uh, I'm pretty sure Australia doesn't have the death penalty, but maybe we can cross our fingers that they did in 1992. Everyone, uh, this show goes out as a podcast and on YouTube. Everyone's always in the YouTube comments. <laughs> it's like, Simon's feeling about the death penalty. Not sure. Simon in every episode. God, I hope they have the death penalty. And it's like, yeah, because I'm like, you know, ethically, I'm like, I don't think it's right to kill people because they killed people. But then I read about these crimes and I'm like, yeah, it's totally okay. Kill them. Let's kill them as soon as possible. Now, let's go. Joanne Walters, meanwhile, was stabbed four times in the chest, once in the neck, and nine times in the back. Two ribs had been completely severed. The killer had taken his time at the site, made camp, drank, and smoked, and it was likely many hours after their initial abduction before the women finally died. Now it's the 5th of October, 1993, over a year later. A man looking for firewood finds two skeletons in Milandro State Forest, and they're later identified as Australian backpackers Deborah Everest and James Gibson, both 19, a couple from Frankston, Victoria. They had last been seen leaving Sydney, headed south to Albury on December 30, 1989, nearly four years earlier. James Gibson's spine had been cut, causing paralysis. Paralysis. Deborah Everest, meanwhile, had been beaten about the head, causing two skull fractures and a broken jaw. Knife marks on the skull indicated that the killer had been cutting her as well, and she'd been stabbed once in the back. Gibson was then stabbed eight times and, where, and was found where he died, in the fetal position. Now it's the 1st of November 1993 and the police have been hunting for more bodies. A skeleton was found in a clearing by a fire trail in Belanglo State Forest. It was later identified as Simone Schmiedel, a German backpacker aged 21, last seen in Sydney on January the 20th 1991 before hitchhiking alone to Melbourne. <laughs> Melbourne. <laughs> I don't know if David's watched one of my video that video before where I pronounce Melbourne Melbourne. Mel but he's putting the in the pronunciation guideline, a pronunciation guide for Melbourne. Melbin, though. M-E-L-B-I-N. So I was, even in the corrected version, I was saying Melbourne. Which I guess is kind of like that. When her friends warned her to be careful, Simone said reassuringly that she was carrying a knife for protection. A few hours later, the killer had tied Simone up and carried her from his vehicle to a small clearing where he, protect, where he proceeded to cut her spinal cord. The killer then built a small campfire and settled in to relax. After a few hours of torment, he stabbed Schmiedel in a, to- a total of eight times, puncturing her heart and lungs, leaving her to die face down before covering the body with a thin layer of leaves and branches, making a pattern resembling an X. There is evidence that the killer returned to the site months later and deposited the clothing of another female victim for reasons unknown. Three days later, on November the 4th, 1993, police found two more skeletons on a nearby fire trail. These belonged to a German couple, Gabor Noga- no- Nogaboa and Anya Habshid, both in their early 20s. 
They had last been seen leaving Sydney for Mildura on the 26th of December 1991. Both were found buried in shallow graves. Gabor, a large and strong man, had been used as target practice and was shot in the head six times. Anya was decapitated and her head has never been found. It must have been taken from the forest as a grim memento, then disposed of later at another distant location. Court records indicate that all but one of the victims showed signs of sexual interference. Police determined that the killer was bisexual. The victim profile was good-looking young hitchhikers. These are the canonical seven victims of the backpacker killer. They were murdered between 1989 and 1992, and their bodies were discovered in Malanglo State Forest between 1992 and and 1993. All of them, except for the bodies of Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters, had lain so long undiscovered in the forest that their bodies had completely decomposed. Such was the usefulness of the remote Australian bushland. And I stress the words canonical seven here, and you'll soon see why. Oh god, because there are so many more. This is... I feel like I say this almost every week, but just the spine cutting thing really makes this, like, worse than... Uh, well, no, I don't know. We've talked about the children being burned in the house and all of this stuff previously. I just feel like all of these are just horribly brutal. And every time I'm like, this is the worst. And then it's like, it's not fact, boy, though, is it? It's not the worst. All of them are the worst. And these people are horrible. Except for the heists, which we occasionally do. The guests get less views, for sure. But I really feel like occasionally we need to cover something that isn't a horrible murder. Because otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll probably go insane. Onions to the rescue. Meanwhile, back in England, the story broke of a serial killer on the loose in New South Wales. This was of particular interest because two of the victims, Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters, were British. Paul Onions was watching the news. He had suffered from symptoms that would later be diagnosed as PTSD from his ordeal near Belanglo State Forest back in 1990. He had not told his family of the attempted murder by the roadside because he didn't want them to go through any mental anguish. The story coming out of Australia again ran alarm bells with Paul's keen instincts. It was the same region where he had escaped his would-be captor. The details of the abduction of backpackers, force binding, and murder in Belanglo Forest seemed all too familiar. A typical person may have ignored the new story and gotten on with his life, but Onions went to the Australian Embassy and made a call to the New South Wales Police on November 13, 1993. His crucial tip disappeared into a sea of other information as the police whittled down a list of 230 murder suspects to 32. The Australian police rediscovered Paul Onion's message on April 13, 1994, five months later, after very few break breaks had been made in the case. I feel like if you're a British dude, I mean, this is back in the day, going to the, taking the effort to go to the Australian embassy, book an appointment, go inside, and then phone a local Australian police department. If I was that police department, I'd be like, that might also be bullshit, but it's a lot less likely. I mean, that's going to, it's more likely that that's going to be a credible tip because the guy, you know, he's like, I feel strongly enough this about this to make a strong effort to give you this tip. I'd just probably pay more attention to that. So they found his tip again. They sent out the, uh, they sent out for the original Boral police report from 1990, but it couldn't be found, or it was not deemed worthwhile to compose one in the first place. They may do with the desk clerk's notes from that day. Paul's story was corroborated by testimony from Joanne Berry, his roadside rescuer. Paul Onions was flown by the New South Wales police to Sydney. He had a flash of paranoia since he had left all of his things, including his passport, in the killer's car, and the man knew exactly who he was and how to reach him, and this could be a trap. That is, that's got to be pretty paranoid. I mean, I feel like there's lots of ways you could check that. Also, you see that man at the airport, or like he tries to get at me somewhere, you'll be like, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> A tense Paul Onions was greeted at the airport by two officers who showed in their badges. On May the 5th, Paul Onions positively identified one Ivan Millat from the photo lineup as the man who had tried to abduct him in January 1990. Ivan Millat was already known to the police and was under surveillance in connection with the Belanglo slayings for several months. Millat had sold his four-wheel drive oot. Is I guess it's some sort of truck? It's in it's in like quote marks. So I assume this is some some Australian thing? maybe oh i should mention that david is australian so he knows all like i mean obviously he doesn't know more about this case just because he's australian i mean i guess he does because it was i mean this seems like pretty big news story anyway but he's going to be more familiar because he because he's australian but i like these australian things like an oot i don't know what that is maybe it's some sort of australian truck i don't know Shortly after the discovery of Clark, so he sold his truck. Shortly after the discovery of Clark and Walters 
in 1992. Milat had no alibi for any of the seven murders or the attack on Paul Lunyans. A girlfriend of one of Ivan's co-workers had also reported him to the police in connection with the murders for essentially being a local weirdo obsessed with guns. Ivan and the entire Milat family were known in the area as mischief makers, my dude. <laughs> And then it said that, that, that mischief would be a very light way. What was he up to? Yeah, he's just, he's up to a bit of mischief. Cutting spines and then murdering people many times. Minimum seven, allegedly. So far. So far, allegedly. But I get the feeling this is going to become all very non-alleged. <laughs> And Ivan in particular was known for a long rap sheet of alleged violent acts and creepy dealings in the past three decades. None of this was substantial enough for an arrest, though. It was the testimony of Paul Onions that clinched things and brought Ivan Millet to the top of the list of suspects. And, the ver and at the very least, the police could bring him for the attack on Onions back in 1990. Yeah, mate, and you've got to be going to prison for that, right? This is four years late. Th that sort of thing. There's always these statute of limitations. And I'm always like, wait, but he shot a gun at someone. <laughs> Should we really have that? But I'm assuming four years is way too short. I don't even know if I, like we don't have something like that in the, in the UK. But I know in America it's always like, yeah, enough time went past, and it's like he's not a criminal anymore. It's okay. Uh, but four years, which I uh, I think it's a good thing most of the time because it's like okay, we don't want to be. Uh, but for this, it's like you're like shooting a dude and like kidnapping him. Be like, let's let's send that dude to prison. It doesn't matter how long it's been. He needs to serve some time because he's crazy. Approximately fifty officers surrounded Millet's house. Well, sorry, did I miss a bit? No, no, they could bring him in for the attack on the owners back in 1990. Okay, approximately 50 officers surrounded Millet's house, arrested him, and raided the premises. At the same time, 250 police raided the houses of his mother and many brothers. They found a gold mine of evidence. Uh, tons of guns, including a rifle found hidden in a wall, and a Bowie knife that matched the descriptions of weapons used in the murders. They found clothing report belonging to the victims, they found backpacks, they found camping equipment, they found cameras. Some of the possessions even had names written on them. Most of these were not even concealed, but were lying right out in the open. Milat had even given one of his female victims' shirts to his girlfriend. You what the f my dude. What is wrong with you? And also, I mean, uh, to be fair like i know we criticize the police a lot in this podcast but often i mean they're the ones catching people and often these guys are caught in this case top job australian police i mean it's been a few years and i mean obviously you didn't catch him before he murdered a bunch of people but this seems like an extremely successful raid Ivan Millet had expressly broken one of the cardinal rules for criminals. You do not take trophies, yes. Or at the very least, you don't keep them in plain view of your house and the houses of your relatives. Add that to the list of casual criminalist rules for criminals. Millat was charged with the murders of the seven bagpackers on the 31st of May. On June the 28th, he fired his defense counsel after his lawyer had advised him to take an insanity plea. After lengthy preliminaries, Ivan Millet's trial began on the 26th of March 1996. After four months and 145 witnesses, Millet was found guilty on all counts, given seven consecutive life sentences with no possibility of parole, and given an additional 18 years for his attack on Paul Onions. After his conviction, Ivan Millet always maintained his innocence, alleging a vast conspiracy theory where the police planted the evidence during the raids in order to quickly pin the crimes on a suspect. Yeah, that seems likely. After they were happy not to have a suspect for, for years, and then they found someone extremely reasonable and now that no one is going to buy this i don't know if they have jury trials or judge trials in australia but either way no one is buying that ivan nobody so unless they do which would be terribly disappointing we'll find out Sydney had recently won a bid to host the 2000 Olympic Games. Millet claimed that the police and city government wanted to sweep the serial killings under the rug. So Sydney and the surrounding area did not gain a reputation for being unsafe. This is a massive stretch, guys. And all it would have taken was swearing several hundred police officers into perpetual secrecy in one of the most high-profile crimes in Australian history. Ivan Millet died painfully on October the 27th, 2009, of esophageal and stomach cancer without ever admitting to his guilt. I like that, da uh, that David included, it's really hard not to say Callum, I like the fact that David included painfully there. I'm glad esophageal cancer and stomach cancer is a painful death. I mean, actually I'm not. I'm really, that sounds terrible. I'm really not because I'm sure lots of people die of that and they're not horrible serial killers. But in this case, I'm glad that it's painful for you, Ivan. I'm glad you had a painful death because you seem like an absolute f***ing monster. So, an escaped victim manages to put a serial killer behind bars and the bastard dies in prison. This would be a tidy ending to our story if we didn't have two more mysteries to solve. Number one, Millet was 45 at the start of the backpacker killings, a rather late bloomer for a serial killer, <clears throat> and there is evidence that his body count was much larger and extended across several decades. 
Number two, the belongings of the victims were found in the houses of Miller family members who almost universally closed ranks and insisted upon Ivan's innocence. What did they know about the killings before Ivan's arrest? And worse, did any of them partake in the murders? Oh my god, you must be, you should investigate the shit out of that family. I mean, I think it's going to be harder, easier, sorry, easier to like, if you're going from the place of having a solid suspects, then you can start looking back on unsolved crimes and tying them together. Hopefully, I mean, it's going to be a lot of police work, but it's, I feel like it would be easier from that side, especially since you've raided their houses and you found all this evidence that the Ivan brother, the main guy, seems to be just happy leaving everywhere. You've probably got tons of other evidence of other weird unsolved shit that you can start going back through. That's going to be easier. What I'm saying is that's going to be easier, an easier starting point than, than just random bodies. Because we could start, you know, going back through the random bodies that have been discovered in like random police records and tying them to this uh, this terrible family who, I mean, allegedly, hopefully, all ends up in prison. Who knows? Meet the Millats. Stepan Milat was a Croatian immigrant born in 1902. Shortly after arriving in Australia, he married. It's really hard not to say Australia without an Australian accent. I always just want to be like Australia. And I have to stop myself because it's not appropriate. He married a local go Mar- girl, Margaret Piddleston, when she was 16, and Stepan was 34. That is, I'm 34, <laughs> like right now, recording this. I mean, the idea of marrying a 16 year old, other than being illegal, I think. Maybe you can marry someone when you're 16 here if you got like permission from their parents or something weird. But uh, what, it's like, what earth are you gonna talk about? <laughs> 16 years old. They went on to have 14 children, or maybe they weren't talking, they were just having lots of children. Between 1939 and 1962, four girls, 10 boys. Ivan was the fifth child of the family, born in 1944. Stepin was a quiet man, old fashioned, hard working. While it is difficult to get an objective idea of the Millet family life, later accounts by third child Boris Millet indicate that the father was prone to use frequent and fairly severe corporal punishment. Apparently. <laughs> ah, yes. Look, another trend in basically every casual criminalist episode ever. Ah, uh, physical abuse or any sort of abuse from parents to children leads to, uh, leads to bad outcomes. Again, shocking. Sarcasm. Ladies and gents, sharp sarcasm. Apparently, Stepin demanded that you had to bring a long, a big stick to your own beating. Beyond that, it's difficult to get an idea of how abusive the household was, and the Millet children almost universally say their upbringing was a happy one. Oh, okay. I mean, apart from the beating. I guess back in the day, it was like, yeah, yeah, of course I beat my children. Of course they do. How else would we stop them from misbehaving? <laughs> Which, I mean, just I guess back in the day was how people thought. So you'd be like, yeah, yeah, no, I had a great childhood. There were beatings, of course there were beatings. Who wasn't beaten? But it was great. We went to Disney and then had a beating. We do know from Boris's accounts the violence was quite common between siblings and they were constantly roughing each other up. Additionally, they had been trained to use guns since the age of six or seven. Oh my god, I was making a comment the other day. <laughs> I can't remember if it was Casual Criminalist. Maybe it was. And uh, I was saying that, you know, it's weird that in uh, it was America and they were like teaching 11 year olds gun safety. And someone wrote to me on Twitter being like, well, it's really good that they have gun safety because it teaches responsible gun ownership and otherwise you'd have a bunch of people who are not responsible with guns and i'm just like dude how about we don't give the 11 year olds guns <laughs> is that not i mean come on that thing about uh bearing arms or whatever that you're constitutionally obliged to that should only apply when you're of a certain age and that age should not be 11 my dude uh we also know the family was a close was close-knit and insular with very little contact with outsiders essentially forming their own little commune i mean the problem with that though is you I mean, unless they're all like into incest as well. It's like a commune you need some outside blood because otherwise it's going to get weird. Again, according to Boris's accounts, the older brother noticed Ivan beginning to display a cruel streak around the age of 12. Ivan go off with his brothers and cause chaos in the neighborhood, committing acts of vandalism. And once he allegedly cut a dog in half with a machete. My dude. Again, again, absolute casual criminalist classic here. If your kid is torturing animals, get them into therapy or to see a psychiatrist because i don't know seems pretty often that if your kid is torturing animals or cutting a fucking dog in half with a machete they you know they've they've got issues that should probably be resolved so you don't end up the parent of a serial killer 
The hallmarks of early age psychopathy, yes, a neurological and built-in lack of empathy. Police were cons constantly playing, paying visits to the Millat household by the age of 13. Ivan became so troublesome that he was briefly packed off to boarding school. That doesn't seem like a good solution. It's like, oh, what am I going to do? Well, my kid's being really naughty, so I'll send them to boarding school where they're going to get less attention. Brilliant. Good job, guys. As I uh, Ivan's adolescence progressed, his crimes escalated to theft, breaking and entering houses, store burglaries, grand theft auto, and petty on-the-spot robberies. At the age of 17, Ivan allegedly confessed to his brother Boris that had shot a taxi driver, Neville Knight, during a robbery gone wrong. He's breaking so many casual criminalist rules. You don't tell other people about your crimes, even your brother. Don't tell people about your crimes, guys. What are you up to? This left Knight paralyzed. Uh, Milat fled during the investigation. Wait, did he murder him or paralyze him? Oh, he just shot him, sorry. He shot a taxi driver and paralyzed him. Uh, he fled during the investigation. Another man, Alan Dillon, went down for the crime and got five years. What? Australia? <laughs> that guy was convicted of paralyzing a taxi driver by shooting him and he went to prison for just five years? Am I the only one who thinks that's an insane? If someone shot me and I got paralyzed they went to and they got out of prison in five years, I mean, five years isn't a short amount of time. But for paralyzing someone with a gun? It should be 20 years. Come on. What the hell? According to Boris, an innocent man went to prison, but Boris did not report. I mean, obviously he's innocent, so this guy shouldn't have gone to prison. But, as you know, he's found guilty. So he got this punishment, which seems very light. At the time, Boris did not want to see Ivan go to prison. Not that it really ma made a difference. Ivan would spend most of the 1960s in and out of prison. He was banged up in juvie at the age of 17 for theft. At 20, he was given a year and a half prison sentence for breaking and entering. Just after he got out, he was caught stealing a car and did two more years. Wait, steal a car, get two years, paralyze a guy, get five? Oh my. At age 22, he was given three more years for theft. That pretty much wrapped up the swinging 60s with him behind bars. Two interesting things to note about this budding criminal career. The first is shortly after one of his releases, Ivan is alleged to have joked that he killed a man and buried his body out in the bush. There is no evidence that this was anything more than a joke and no missing person or victim has ever been identified. But given his later career, it does give one pause for thought. Second, when Ivan was 20 and already in trouble with the law, he alleged he had stolen a car and when the cops came to nab him, his younger brother Bill, aged 17, by his own account took the blame and served a little over a year in jail. Jeez, okay, <laughs> good brother. Such were the isolationist loyalties of the Millat family, where they appeared to operate a little like thieves, a thieves' guild with no respect for whom they hurt or wider society's established laws. It was that sort of secretive collective over which a charismatic psychopath like Ivan quickly developed a personal dominance and cultivated fierce, unquestioning loyalty in the majority of his siblings. A charismatic criminal Casanova. <laughs> I don't like the C word. Like, I, I, I mean, I don't exactly lay off the swearing. And I was reading an article about the other day about how you don't need to swear to like make a, make a stronger point. I'm like, oh my god, I'm always swearing to make a stronger point. And I'm like, I wish I was smarter and could make a stronger point without having to resource to cursing. But I don't like the C word. It's just unpleasant to say. It feels, I don't know, in British English. I feel like Americans are always like, eh, the British are like C word, that C word, this. And uh, I don't know. We, we definitely are. But I just find it particularly unpleasant. Which brings us... <laughs> I also remember when I was first introduced to this word about 11 or 12 years old. And I had no idea what it meant. So I kind of imagined some sort of like scary creature. Um, and that, that was what I thought it meant. Which is a fascinating story fact. Why, why don't you carry on with the script, yes? Which brings us to Ivan Millet's personality. Well, I feel like we've touched a lot on his personality. His personality is straight psycho. Some psychopaths graduate from killing puppies to being smelly, corpulent perverts like John Wayne Gacy. Not so with Ivan Millat, who became a charismatic psychopath more akin to a bogan version of Ted Bundy. It is worthwhile to note that an estimated 1-5% of the human population are born with a mild to severe form of psychopathy, or an unusually low amount of empathy for others that can even be detected on MRI scans. Oh my god, 1-5% some… I suppose some degree of psychopathy is like… I mean, that just means you're less empathetic at some point. I mean, it's not going to be like psychopath, not psychopath. It's going to be like the empathy sliding scale. I mean, you get some people who are ridiculously empathetic and they're, I guess, the people you want to be friends with. And then you gradually drift down the scale towards people and then it's like, no, I don't even know what it's like to feel. <laughs> you're like, oh, those people are in trouble. 
In terms of evolution, it makes sense for some of our human ancestors to have been a bit more cutthroat in order to survive and pass on their genes, provided they were not so repugnant that they were exiled from a hunter gatherer community. Many individuals with undiagnosed psychopathy go their entire lives excelling in fields like business, law, or politics without ever killing anyone, or at least not getting caught. So, oh. Yeah, this is the thing. Um, there's plenty of. We cover people on casual criminals all the time. A lot of them get caught or found out. So I'm sure there's plenty. You know, the number of unsolved murders out there is fairly high because most people are just not getting caught. People who knew Ivan Millet almost universally describe him as a loner who kept his inner thoughts to himself, but nevertheless was a smooth talker. Many of them also describe him as kind and generous. Both uh, those who knew him and the cops who interrogated him describe him as sublimely confident. His response under extreme negative pressure seems to simply have been to smile or to smirk. When Ivan was in his 20s and 30s, he would go around immaculately dressed and was tan, handsome, and muscular. He inspired admiration and envy in many men. He inspired lust in many women. What's that phrase? Men want to be him, women want to be with him. Is that is that James Bond? Is that I don't know what that refers to, but sounds like this dude. Unlike many ugly or creepy rapist murderers, he seemed to have no problems in that department. Though criminal psychologists have explained that sex for Ivan was not about emotional connection or physical gratification, it was about control. The same went for his relations with his family. As such, he cultivated and enjoyed a godlike power over the family and women in his life. More than once, the two groups intersected. Oh, wait, <laughs> what? Uh, I don't know, wait, we're not necessarily talking incest. Because it could just be he has an affair with his brother's wife or something. Let's carry on and see whether it's incest. <laughs> Ivan is known to have conducted lengthy affairs with his sister's in-law. Ivan, okay, good. <laughs> I mean, the best thing about it so far. <laughs> Ivan is confirmed to have conducted an 11-year on and off relationship with Marilyn Melat, the wife of his older brother Boris. Ivan would visit Marilyn while her husband was away at work. The affair was so extensive that Ivan became the illegitimate father of Marilyn's daughter, Linnees, who was born in the mid-1960s. Boris raised the girl as his own. When Boris found out about the affair, his father, Stepan, allegedly encouraged Boris to kill Ivan. Holy shit, Dad. <laughs> what are you up to? But he soon relented, saying, you should kill the man who takes your wife. But on the other hand, Ivan is my son, and I do not want you to kill my son. Brilliant reasoning there, Stepan. You, uh... Your big brain. This gives you a peek into the temperament of the Millat household. According to Boris, the cuckolded brother, older brother, at one point aimed a gun at Ivan but was unable to shoot him because his mother kept stepping in the way. Marinin kept up her affair with Ivan for some time and took up with him again in the late 1980s, but allegedly dumped him when Ivan refused to commit to her. Until his death, Marinin expressed sympathy for Ivan and is reported in some newspapers calling him the love of her life. Don't do that. I mean, this is only going to be news a news story afterwards right after the guys turned out to be this like multi uh, this serial killing murderer so don't be saying afterwards that he's your lo the love of your life that just is a bad play be like barely knew him barely knew him uh, we just we just had an affair it was maybe a month not definitely not 11 continuous years where i had his illegitimate son and fell deeply in love with him don't say that bad advice but you need better pr it should be noted that boris millet is one of the few family members who has openly denounced Ivan as guilty as charged and a horrendous psychopath and kit serial killer. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> of course you do. He had an affair with your wife. Due to his openness, and also he's super guilty. Uh, due to his openness, he also became a prime source for the inner workings of his family and an otherwise tightly lipped group of people. However, the Millat family alleged that Boris simply makes these statements out of revenge against Ivan for stealing his wife, a charge that Boris firmly denies. From the interviews I've seen, I don't think Boris is acting solely out of revenge, but is generally horrified at what his brother has done. Yeah, and also, also, plus side, revenge. <laughs> it's like it's not doing it for revenge, but it is a very sweet extra. However, in some interviews, I get the vague impression that Boris may not always be telling the full truth about what went on. I submit all of this to you so I can simply so you can simply weigh the claims and the information accordingly for yourself. Ivan is also noted to have carried on a one-year affair with Maureen Millat. It's like, does he only like having uh, does he only like having relationships with people who have the same surname as him? My dude, come on. Who was briefly the wife of Ivan's younger brother, Wally. Maureen testifies that she always found Ivan kind and insightful, and expressed shock and horror when Ivan was arrested for the backpacker killings. Unlike much of the family, Maureen does not claim Ivan Millet is innocent, but in interviews she appears to be firmly in denial and in emotional turmoil from learning what the man she once adored had turned out to be. Such was the power 
of Ivan's spell. It should also be noted that Wally is one of the Milat brothers who is sometimes alleged to have partaken in some of Ivan's crimes. Uh oh. Uh oh. F- finally, there is. So we said allegedly there, so I guess he didn't go down for it. And it was 30 years ago, not early 90s, so yeah. Okay. I get the feeling the family's kind of going to get away with this, and Ivan's going to be the only one who goes to jail. Kind of disappointingly. Finally, there is the wife of Ivan's younger brother, Bill, named Caroline. Dude, what are you up to? While there is absolutely no evidence or substantial claim that Ivan had an affair with Caroline Millat, again, well, I mean, pretty strong correlation. She has his surname. <laughs> Should have an affair with him. Uh, he, she herself claims that her, Ivan and her were on extremely intimate terms. I think there's very little uh, it to be interpreted there. Extremely intimate implies just one thing, doesn't it? I mean, they were definitely having an affair, no? Okay. Best friends, if you like. Oh. Extremely intimate is like, I, I, I have close friends. I don't say I'm extremely intimate with them. That would probably imply that I'm having an affair with them. It's just, I don't know. I would, I definitely, I don't know. Maybe I'm just misinterpreting those words, but it's not how I would use them. And Caroline Miller, despite being of no blood relation to Ivan, became one of his most strident and outspoken advocates after his conviction. She was foremost among the family, a media spokesperson. Caroline alleges that the possessions found in the Miller's households were not confirmed to have belonged to the victims and has claimed in interviews that they may have been a police plant. Oh, come on. We already discussed this nonsense. Both she and Bill Millat were frequent visitors to Ivan while he was in prison, and Caroline also spoke right. Wait, who was Bill? Was that her husband? Yes, sorry, that was her husband. Uh, were frequent visitors to Ivan while he was in prison, and Caroline also spoke regularly to Ivan on the phone. At the very least, this is a testament to Ivan's magnetism, which inspired blind, devoted loyalty. And perhaps one might even go as far as to opine an infatuation with him. Yeah, I mean, he does seem to be this, like, classic cult leader serial killer, like, super charming dude that, even when he's like, yeah, no, he's definitely guilty of murdering several people. Oh, but he's so nice. I mean, Ted Bundy's the example people often quote, right? People were still like Ted Bundy. I but look at him, he's so handsome and charming. I don't know if Ted Bundy got married in prison, but he probably could they killed him, right? They murdered him. I murdered him. They executed him. But he could have got he could have got married in prison. People do. It's crazy. I don't understand. It's like what's going on? Given the amount of one way wife swapping <laughs> that might <laughs> one way wife swapping, I like that term. That seemed to be going on, it certainly is legitimate to ask a few questions. Rape and Marriage It's 1971. The long party of the swinging 60s was over, and the greasy hair of the dog-laced hangover of the 1970s had begun. Ivan had been several months out of prison. Then, on February the 12th, his younger sister Margaret, aged 16, was killed in a head-on collision with another vehicle. The car she was in had been driven by her brother, Wally, who survived. Two weeks later, a woman named Karen Rowland, aged 20 and five months pregnant, went missing. Three months later, her body was found in the Fair Barn Pine Plantation near Canberra. She had been raped and strangled. She was last seen talking to a person in a car who had pulled up alongside her in the suburb of Campbell after her own car had run out of petrol. Cops and criminologists strongly suspect that Ivan Millard may have been responsible for her death given his later MO and the fact that he was operating in this area at the time. He also reportedly had no alibi, but this has never been proven conclusively in a court of law. Some have also theorized that the death of Ivan's sister had triggered his homicidal behavior. It's just when you think this couldn't get any worse, he murders a pregnant lady. Brilliant. Also in 1971, Ian Heyman, then aged 15, claims he was hitchhiking home to Wollongong when he was picked up by two men in a oot. They began inquiring about his family and their knowledge of his movements. The men took the turn off towards Canberra rather than going on to Wollongong. An argument broke out between Heyman and the men over whether anyone was truly expecting him at home. Finally, the two men threw the boy out of the car. Heyman crossed the road to hitch another ride. The two men parked 100 meters away and watched him. Luckily, Heyman got into another car and was driven home. Heyman identified one man as Ivan Millat, but he refuses to identify the second man for legal reasons. It's unknown whether this account is true or whether Heyman is just a fantasist. The whole legal reasons thing for not identifying the other man is like, what legal reasons could that possibly be? You're at the police station. And why could you identify one and not the other? Seemed that's... 
Uh, and also the guy didn't seem to work with a partner at all in any of the other cases that we know about. So I'm leaning on that guy being a bit of a fantasist, to be honest. What's more certain is the following story, also from 1971. On April the 9th, Margaret Patterson and her friend Greta, whom she met four months earlier in a mental institution where they were both being treated for depression, had decided to hitchhike from Liverpool in southwest Sydney to Melbourne. They are confirmed to have been picked up by Ivan Millet. The two women, both aged 18, allege the Millet drove them to the woods and threatened them at knife points. Millet proceeded to allegedly rape Margaret Patterson. From there, Millet took them to a service station near Gulbin. There, the women let slip to other customers what had happened, and they proceeded to surround Ivan Millet's car in an angry mob. That seems... wait. Why didn't he kill them? Was this before he got into his killing? Because you got to be insane... like... They let slip what had happened. If I was in a petrol station in these ladies' situation, in these women's situation, I'd be like, uh, I'm not letting anything slip. I have, like, my friend was raped and he's probably going to murder us. Could someone please help? It's not letting something slip. It's just like call, crying for help. Of course. What else would you do? He was arrested and charged while awaiting trial. Millet faked his own death and fled to New Zealand. Whoa! He was discovered and rearrested in 1974. At the trial, Margaret changed her story and claimed that she had given Ivan consent. Greta, none too impressed at being abducted, stuck to the original version of events. Wow, this is crazy. What is the motivation here? The fact that they were recent releases from a psychiatric ward prejudices the court. Furthermore, Ivan Millet's lawyer John Marsden, a gay man who had frequented a club the night before and had seen the two women there, outed them as lesbians to the court. This further prejudiced the 1970s court against the witnesses. The case was thrown out and Ivan walked. I was trying to work out what the prejudice was because I'm like, well, he raped them. It's not, oh, although one of them later said she consented, which seems very strange. But doesn't like mean they're lying it just means he raped them they don't have like <laughs> but then i realized it's the 1970s and uh yeah being gay back then was uh yeah that could prejudice the court that was 50 years ago pretty crazy afterward ivan put his nose to the grindstone and got a um, although maybe i don't know does that i don't want i feel like people are writing to me like simon there's still prejudice today and it's like i know there's prejudice but uh, there was more of it in the 1970s. Afterward, Ivan put his nose to the grindstone and got a job as a truck driver. This provided him with a plausible excuse for traveling all over the state. In October 1975, Ivan Millett met Karen Duck, then aged 16 and six months pregnant. Now that was nearly 31. Like father, like son. I guess, after a year of dating, the two moved in together in early 1977 with Karen's illegitimate child, Jason. After an allegedly rocky relationship of ups and downs, or shacked up with a psychopath, quite a surprise there, the two married seven years later in February 1984. They stayed together for three more years until early 1987 when Karen walked out alleging domestic abuse. It would also seem that Millet was allegedly a child support dodger and he was chased for the money and again, allegedly in 1988, firebombed the garage of Karen's parents as a warning to let the matter drop. Uh, holy sh**, get the police in there. A small point of interest is that while in prison for the backpacker murders, Ivan claims to have only gone to Balango State Forest once with his brother Alex to do some shooting. Karen claims that while they were married, Ivan took her and Jason to Balango State Forest no less than four times. He's been up to some murdering in that state forest, hasn't he? Without his brother. Like, maybe they went once together and then the other three times it's like, yeah, 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 I'm going to go shooting with my brother. And really, you're off doing some murder. Murder as a coping strategy, oh good lord. The dates of Ivan's relationship with Karen are fairly important. They met in 1975, had many fights dotting their history until 1987 when Karen walked out for good. The cops who led the investigation into Malat have theorized that he was a control-obsessed killer. Whenever relationships in his life were in turmoil, he would kill in order to calm himself down. Every date during his relationship with Karen, where Milat was implicated in a disappearance or a murder of a hitchhiker, Ivan appears to have been at odds with his former wife. Then, after they separated in 1987 and the divorce gradually became final two years later the seven canonical backpacker killings began the final murders of clark and walters in april 1992 happened two months before melas met another serious girlfriend cha linda hughes and settled down again these i mean we've got the canonical seven but this dude murdered way more people right i mean come on during the manhunt for the then unknown Balanglo killer in 1993, the police received a tip from two women with legally enforced pseudonyms, Mary and Teresa. They claimed to have been abducted by a man while hitchhiking back to Canberra 
In 1997, when they were both 18, the man pulled off the highway into Belanglo, telling the women it was a shortcut and later pulled onto a dirt road, saying he forgot to use the toilet back at the service station. It's at this point that he made a grab for Mary. Mary punched him. She and Teresa ran into the forest and hid. They lay on the ground for hours until the man gave up looking for them and left. Back in 1993, the two women independently looked at a photo lineup, lineup and marked out both Ivan Millet and his younger brother Richard. None of this, however, could be used in court, and the attempted rape remains a cold case. Why can none of that be used in court? What? I don't get it. The police are doing all this work. They line up all these people and are like, yeah, 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 it was them in a lineup with i assume other innocent people because that's how a lineup works right and then it's like well why did the police all do this work for the course to be like yeah we can't use that in court what am i missing why not come on leanne goodall was last seen on the 30th of december 1978 leaving the star hotel in newcastle new south wales she then disappeared without a trace. Robin Hickey was last seen standing at a bus stop on the Pacific Highway at 7.15 p.m. on the 7th of April 1979. Two weeks later, Amanda Robinson, 14, disappeared while she was walking along Lake Road in Swansea. Annette Briffer, 18, disappeared while she was hitchhiking on the Pacific Highway near Asquith on January 10, 1980. Nurses Gillian Jameson and Deborah Balkan, both aged 20, were last seen leaving a man fitting Ivan Millet's description at the Tollgate Hotel in Sydney on the July the 12th, 1980. At 9.15 p.m., they called their flatmates, telling them they'd be attending a party in Wollongong and to call their work and tell them they'd be too sick to work over the following days. It's a hell of a party. I'm... <laughs> They're not a party. Ivan Merlat had periodically been implicated by the police in all these disappearances. Colin Powell, a backpacker from the UK, claims to have been picked up by Ivan Millet, driven off the highway and then threatened with a hammer before escaping to another vehicle in 1982. Powell never reported the incident to police as he felt no clear crime had been committed. Um, except for being threatened with a hammer and I guess kidnapping when he doesn't take you where you want to go or like where he said he was going to go. Given the lateness of his revelations to Australian media only in the last few years, it's possible that the man is a fantasist. More solid is the case of Peter Letcher, age 18, who disappeared after hitchhiking to Bathurst from Sydney on November 13, 1987. His body was found dumped and covered with branches in the Jenland State Forest on January 21, 1988. He had been stabbed multiple times in the back and shot five times in the head while his jumper had been used to blindfold him. Cigarette butts and a whiskey bottle were found at the scene. Mel out, whose wife had left him, was working in the Jenland State Forest at the time. It was him. That absolutely fits his MO to a T. Diane Penachio, a married woman aged 29 with a young toddler, disappeared from the Lake George Hotel on September 6, 1991, while the canonical backpacker murders were ongoing. Her body was found in Talaganda State Forest on November 13, lying face down, covered in branches. She had been stabbed in the spine. The arrangement of her clothes suggested sexual assault. A bottle and a can of beer were found at the scene. Now, the final two cases coincide with Ivan Millet's rampage following the breakdown of his marriage. The murders strongly fit Millet's modus operandi. The lead investigator on Millet, Clive Small, states that these two killings were, um, were almost certainly the work of Millet. The other disappearances are more tenuous in their connection to Millet, and while some of them fit Millet's MO and the area of operations, police also strongly suspect there was another predator operating in the area at the time of these disappearances. That man, if he exists, has never been caught. At most, Miller's body count increases from the canonical 7 to 16 people, counting Karen Rowland from 1971, in addition to several attempted abductions, a rape, and attempted rapes. At the very least, however, police are convinced that Miller's, uh, Millat's body count extends to 9 or 10 people. And for what it's worth, Boris Millat suspects that the true number is roughly double the canonical number of victims. Yeah, but also, these are just kind of the people that we know about. There's probably plenty of bodies that have never been discovered. And these are almost all of them. It's like, well, not all of them, but people escaped or it, it was early on before he was mur like murdering everybody and stuff like that. There's got to be lots of other bodies. You can't just assume that there aren't ones we haven't found at all or have no leads on whatsoever. Surely I, I would always, I feel like that would be the majority, but maybe that's just me. What do the family know? Which brings us back to Ivan Millet's picturesque little family. Ivan's father, Stepan, died in 1983, and whatever he thought of Ivan's criminal behavior up to that point, the man took it to his grave. Ivan's mother, Margaret, died in 2001, long after Ivan was locked up in prison. She reportedly had hoped to have seen Ivan freed before she died. Mate, 
He's gone to prison for multiple murders. He's not getting out of prison. Margaret Millett also frequently visited Ivan in prison. According to a younger brother, George Millett, she allegedly told Ivan that she was dying and even asked if Ivan did the murders. If the story is to be believed, Ivan admitted his guilt then and there. Conversely, numerous possessions of the victims, including one of Paul Onions' shirts, were found in his mother's house, implying that Ivan had simply gifted a man's shirt to his mother and she'd kept it for four years, or else she was somewhat aware of what he was up to before his arrest. In her defense, she did not appear to be the brightest of sparks. When claiming Ivan's innocence, she is once quoted as saying, I did all the clothes washing for these boys, and never once did I see any blood. <laughs> Brilliant argument. Five stars, ten out of ten there. <laughs> For what it's worth, according to Boris Millat, he says the family was vaguely aware that Ivan was doing terrible things prior to his arrest, but the family's culture of tight-lipped behavior prevented any of them, including his own mother, from inquiring any further. This claim seems to be contradicted by one tiny coincidence. By his own account, to erase his shame for his brother's deeds, Boris changed his surname from Millat, and he did it one month before Ivan's arrest in 1994. Uh-oh. I mean, that's not a crime. And I'd is not reporting crimes that you know about a crime? I don't think so, right? I mean, that would be a pretty heavy like burden to put on a population if it's like, yeah, you know about a crime that so you have to tell the police. I feel as you, you morally probably should. Um, maybe? I don't know. It seems like that's a pretty intense thing to put upon people. How do I not know if that's a crime or not? <laughs> Also, but we should learn from the rules of casual criminals. Don't tell people about your crimes. Then you'd have to worry about it. And this dude's changing his name, which definitely implies that he knew about crimes and that they would be pretty bad. Like, if you have to change your name, you're like, well, that person's going to get famous or infamous for the severity of their crimes. Mm. When asked in an interview what he felt when Ivan was caught, Boris replied, relief that this wouldn't go on anymore. Why none of this is conclusive, it is mildly suspect indeed. Still more suspicious are comments attributed to Richard Millet, Ivan's little brother, when he was in a pub shortly after the discovery of the skeletons of Everest and Gibson in October 1993. Visibly drunk, Richard is rumored to have said, They haven't found those Germans yet. Indeed, the bones of the three German tourists would not be found until the following month. If this account is to be believed, Ivan had the very least told his brother of his crimes. Ah, uh -oh, breaking those rules. Richard is also the leading suspect, other than Ivan, for having participated in the Malanglo murders. Another suspicious event happened in 1992, shortly after the discovery of the of British backpackers Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters. Alex Millat, an old brother, went to the police and allegedly gave a misleading report, claiming that he had seen two cars pass him with women resembling the victims, one in each car. They were gagged and bound, and the cars were driven by two men. Apparently, he had seen all this in the split second it would have taken them to pass by his own vehicle. <laughs> it's possible Alex was trying to get his family out ahead of police suspicion by reporting on it first. What is also intriguing is that Alex describes the mode of abduction as two men and two cars instead of one man acting alone. At the time of the police raid, Alex was in the possession of one of the backpacks of the victims. He died in 2018. All of, I mean, these guys are just like bad and trying to cover up crimes. And uh, yeah. Well, the main guy went to prison. These guys don't go to prison, do they? It's kind of disappointing. He just died in 2018 free. Uh. Meanwhile, John Marsden, the lawyer who got Ivan Millett off the rape charge in 1974 and whom Ivan had fired as defense counsel for suggesting an insanity plea in 1994, made a deathbed confession back in 2006. Marsden claimed that Ivan's sister, Shirley Swore, Nee Millat had helped in two of the killings. Additionally, Shirley was living with Ivan at the time of his arrest in the house where most of the trophies were found. In Shirley's own room, police found the sleeping bag of Deborah Everest. Shirley also allegedly hid a pistol from the police uh, during the raid and later told her brother Wally to get rid of it. Finally, in a bizarre twist, Shirley was rumored to have had an incestuous relationship with Ivan, a claim that has been allegedly acknowledged by at least two members of the Millat family. Shirley died in 2003. All of this is crazy. The incestuous relationship, crazy. What's most crazy? <laughs> it's like, why? I, I can't believe we haven't talked about it yet, but keeping all the shit. Like, Ivan goes out killing people, and then he's like, hey, Sister Shirley, I got you a sleeping bag. It's slightly used, and she holds onto it for all of these years. I mean, what are you up to? You're a terrible criminal. Knowing or helping. It's the official position of the investigators of the Millet case that, yes, the family were aware of Ivan's actions. It seems incredibly likely 
And no, Ivan did not have any accomplices and acted alone. Indeed, it would seem that Ivan had the rap sheet best fitting the profile of a serial killer. On the flip side, Ivan was convicted of the Belanglo murders on fairly circumstantial evidence. They never really found any matching fingerprints or matching DNA at the site. It was really the attack on Paul Onions that clinched Ivan's arrest and conviction. Failing to find enough evidence to charge any other family member for partaking in the murders, naturally the official position of the police would be that Ivan acted alone. But some commentators, including the victim's families, have speculated that the police are less stringent in that opinion in private. Yeah, allegedly. Allegedly. And I don't even know. It's all very extremely like, maybe, for participation, and in my opinion, yeah, yeah, they knew. They knew. For what it's worth, Boris Millet says that the prime suspects for collaboration in Ivan's murders, brothers Richard, Wally, Bill, and Alex Millet, did not have it in them to be cruel or kill anybody. As for the role of Shirley Squire, at the time of writing, Boris has yet to comment. While it is possible that Boris is loyally covering for his family members who did not sleep with his ex-wife while focusing his rage on Ivan, it's also possible that Boris was simply kept out of the loop around the particulars of the murders. Quite smart given, you know, is that probably don't tell the guy whose wife you're having an affair with about your crimes. I mean, we mentioned it like 18 times in today's episode. Don't tell people about your crimes. Especially don't tell people who hate you. He had already been estranged from Ivan for decades by the time the Belanglo murders occurred. Only one extreme reaction, a panic attack, when acted when asked in 2019 about how the murder victims died, seemed to indicate any deeper knowledge. And that could quite simply have been a fear of overwhelming grief for the victims, or a fear of that people think you have something to do with it. During Ivan Millett's trial in 1996, his new defense lawyer surprisingly pointed the finger at Richard Millett for being responsible for the murders. The defense lawyer alleged that Paul Onions mistook Ivan for Richard. However, Richard had alibis for the times of the Belanglo abductions. He was either at work or with a large number of family members, not the latter counts for much since so many of them seem to be the most tremendously tight-lipped pack of liars. They seem to be more than willing to fake an alibi. What is intriguing about this incident is that Ivan at the time allegedly claimed that he was happy with the defense lawyer's submissions, which means on some level Ivan was perfectly happy to screw over his brother if it meant that he got off scot-free. Only later did Ivan claim that he was shocked that his own lawyer made that argument somehow unbeknownst to him. Ah, oh, look, Ivan is a piece of sh what a surprise. Further still, in an infamous 60 Minutes interview, Richard Millat was asked how trophies from the murders came to wind up in his garden shed. Richard clammed up, as was his custom, and, and fixed the interviewer with a stony, menacing stare. His answers were evasive. This convinced many watching at the time that Richard and maybe other family members had participated in the murders. However, Richard may just have been clumsily covering for Ivan. Judge David Hunt said on sentencing Ivan that it was inevitable he was not alone in the killings. Indeed, much of the initial investigation focused on finding two or more men. This was for several reasons. One, it was not easy for one man to subdue two people at once, especially in the case of the German couple where the boyfriend, Gabor, was six foot one and quite strong. Boris Mellat himself offers a counter argument to that. That's that you aim a gun at a person and tell them on pain of death to tie the other up. Two, the victims were both murdered in different ways and often buried separately, 50 to 100 meters apart, implying two people's handiwork at play. Three, at each killing site, the murderer or murderers seem to have thrown a bit of a party with multiple kinds of booze, bullets, and cigarettes. Four, ballistics expert Gerard Dutton has claimed that the target practice sessions may be consistent with two or more people firing. 5. While the Millat brothers may have alibis for the time of the attacks, assuming they weren't fabricated, if Ivan held the victims at the killing sites for long enough, his brothers could have joined them in the actual murders or in the cleanup. And indeed, Ivan could have held the victims in the forest for a day or more after their abductions before killing them. Such was the state of decomposition of all the victims that forensics teams could hardly pin the time of death to the hour or even a specific day. That is a lot of time for an accomplice to skate around an alibi. And six, if Ian Heyman's account is to be believed, then it was two men, not one, who tried to abduct him back in 1971, implying that sometimes Ivan Millett had a ride-along partner. Now I'm twisted around on it again. Like, I mean, this is pretty strong. It's all like, yeah, maybe... But also like, yeah, I think he could have pulled it off himself. So whether Ivan Millet acted alone and his family did not know anything until after his arrest, or the family knew all about his deeds beforehand but did not partake, or whether his brothers actively participated in a sick kind of boys' day out deliverance style, it really is up to the listener to decide. Yeah, there's there's compelling stuff every there's compelling stuff in all directions on this one. 
Nothing except Ivan Millet's slaying of the canonical seven has ever been conclusively proven in a court of law. In conclusion, the whole thing was a stitch up by the Sydney Olympic Committee and the New South Wales Police. Hashtag Illuminati confirmed. <laughs> a whimpering bit of closure. The more I look into this family, the greater the sinking feeling I have in the pit of my stomach. From psychopaths to rapes to murders to affairs to incest to potential accomplices and accessories to murder. The case is intriguing, but there is a difference between the roadkill fascination of true crime and poking around in a carcass with a stick for three days, making careful notes on every maggot you find. This is an emotion writ large across the entire nation of Australia whenever Ivan Miller hits the news cycle again. The body count may not be particularly high as far as serial killers are concerned, but the story and its savagery has haunted Australia for nearly 30 years. Yeah, I mean, this has been a long episode, but back at the beginning, the details of the killings? Some disturbing shit. The case is worsened by the fact that Ivan Miller, smirking for decades as he was dragged in chains from prison cell to prison cell, never publicly admitted his guilt. The families of the victims can never be 100% certain that the man who stole their loved ones from them actually died behind bars or that some of his accomplices actually walked free. Ivan Millet robbed the families of the victims and the nation of Australia of that kind of closure. More perversely, Ivan Millet condemned his fanatically loyal family to forever shoulder the burden of denying his guilt before the world, much to their utmost universal condemnation. Only one family member seems to have fully escaped this fate. Older brother Boris changed his surname back to Millet in the years following Ivan's imprisonment. He is effectively owning the fact that he is a millet, but he had nothing to do with his brother's crimes and openly condemns them, and he sympathizes with the victims. Nevertheless, Boris seems damaged by the many ways in which his brother has ruined his life. It's like being married to Hitler's daughter, Boris once said. And, well, that pretty much sums it up. The lead investigator, Clive Small, did manage to wring one final tiny bit of closure out of the case before Ivan died. Clive visited Millet in prison. Ivan was angry. Why do you accuse my sister of aiding the killings? He said in reference to Shirley Swar. Clive Small replied, I didn't. I know you acted alone. To which Millet shouted, Yes, so why are you accusing my sister? Then Millet's expression slowly changed to shock and self-disbelief. For once, he wasn't smirking. This was as close to a confession as the police ever got. And I think, I think that was probably a bit of honesty from him. I, I'm kind of, I kind of think he acted alone. My conclusions, just mine, in my opinion, allegedly, he acted alone. His family knew he was up to some dodgy shit. More family members knew. Uh, some family members knew more than others, but I don't think any were necessarily involved in the crimes themselves. Like even the forensic guy, he said, yeah, it may look as if the bodies were shot by multiple people, but it's a may. It's not like definitely. Dismembered appendices. Bill Millat's daughter, Deborah Millat, surname changed to Muleman, gave birth to a son named Matthew in 1992. He was the great nephew of Ivan Millat. As the boy reached adolescence, his mood, mood seemed to darken and he became obsessed with death and the Millat family history. This intensified to the point that Matthew changed his surname to Millat at the age of 14. Dude, <laughs> that's like some creepy. It's like, what well, are you changing your surname to? Yeah, Manson. Brilliant. <laughs> What's your service? Hitler. Yeah, I thought Hitler would be a good one to go for. Get into therapy. Court evidence seems to indicate that Matthew was LARPing at being a hard man and a member of a local criminal dynasty to impress his schoolmates. That is so sad, mate. On November 20th, 2010, Matthew Millat and his accomplice Cohen Klein lured their friend David Octoloni to the victim's birthday in the Belanglo State Forest and murdered him with an axe? What the f***? No! That, that, what the f this went from like sad kid need doesn't have a life doesn't have anything going from him so he's like he clings on to like this crazy dark legacy of his horrible family to oh no he's actually, he actually murdered someone what the come on they recorded the murder on a phone <laughs> oh! Well, I mean, great, so they're going to go to prison forever, I suppose. David can be heard begging for his life. Well, I don't want to know, man. I don't want to know. I'm just going to read that silently. <laughs> uh, he begs for his life. They shout abuse at him. And yeah, the, look, okay, we don't need, like, I read the details. They're too much. Um, The guy's murdered on, they, and they record it. No one wants to see that. And if you do, check yourself. <laughs> 
But Matthew Millat lacked his great uncle's talent for avoiding detection. He was arrested two days after the murder. Good. In 2002, 12, he was sentenced to 43 years in prison, 30 years without parole. Being only 18 at the time of the murder, the earliest Matthew Millat will get out is 2042. Such a senseless copycat killing and the contortion of the mind of a young man is the final legacy of Ivan Millat's reign of terror. Well, that was a horrible, horrible ending to today's story. Um, I know these are, I don't expect happy endings, but that was like a curveball of like, of extra horror. Thanks, David. This has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it and you're listening to this in its podcast form, please do me a big favor. Leave me a good review. Five stars preferred. But, uh, you know, just be honest. Be like, I mean, it's a bit shit, isn't it, Simon? Stop talking and just read the bloody script. Then uh, weaker reviews are, of course, you know, not preferred. <laughs> But yeah, leave me a review uh, if you feel like it. It helps get this podcast in front of more people, which is fantastic. If you're watching on YouTube, there is a like button below, a subscribe button below. You can smash those. Uh, and yeah, that's about it from me. Thank you for uh, for being here for the episode. And I'll see you next time.